evening and welcome to NRA's Facebook Live session. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And we welcome you all to our regular updates from Facebook. So it's a great privilege to welcome Tracy French, who is a rheumatology clinical nurse educator from Bristol Royal Infirmary. And she's here to give you all an insight in how nurses can help people living with RA. We have received some questions that we will attempt to answer this evening. However, some require some very specific medical information, which we are not able to give online. I hope that by the end of the evening, you'll feel a lot more confident about approaching your rheumatology team to ask them these questions in person. If not, then you're welcome to call the helpline and we can try and direct you to people that might be able to explain these situations. So welcome, Tracy. Yeah. To begin, can you give us a rundown on what nurse consultations are and how patients can get the best out of them? Yeah, I can. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, okay, so I'm guessing that uh, people that are tuning in have probably got various different experiences and are probably at different points on their, their journey from their diagnosis. So I was just gonna talk a little bit about the, the nurse's role and then the different times you're probably going to have an interaction with a nurse and the kind of things a nurse can offer, and then talk a little bit about um, best ways to get the most out of the consultation, um, and then some little sort of tips and things like that. So the nurse role, I'm guessing you have hopefully seen a nurse face-to-face -face in clinic, but during COVID it may have been more over the telephone um, for planned consultations, but obviously also um, the nurse advice lines in every department are the, the sort of the main way that, that patients, I would say, get support, particularly in between their consultations. Um, the nurse's role is um, quite varied, really. I guess the, the main thing is, is education about diagnosis and about medications, but supporting patients as well and signposting patients to um, other health professionals or to other um, points of, of care that could be in the community and to obviously NRAS and, and other supporting um, charities and so on. Um, I think also as well, the role is very much, I see it as a kind of a link between the patient and the rheumatology team and also the GP as well. So we're often communicating between all those, those people that are involved in the care to obviously try and get the best for the patient. So the first time probably that most people are going to meet a nurse um, specialist would be when they're first diagnosed, they'll have seen the consultant, get the diagnosis. For some people that's a, a positive thing to finally get a, a name for what's going on for other people that's really frightening um, and um, the nurse visit hopefully should come quite soon after you've seen the doctor in some centers i know it's the same day in our department it's usually a, a week or so afterwards and that visit then is is quite crucial to um, get quite a lot of information about the diagnosis and about the medication but also from a support perspective and from the, the nurse's perspective i think it's it's quite key for the nurse to pick up on what's said but also what's not said the kind of things the patient's struggling with and then try and give support because that could be that although they're in a lot of pain and struggling and you need to talk about the medication for the patient it may be that you know that they're, they're, they're at risk of losing their job and and they're struggling in their relationship or something so it's about trying to sort of pick up all of the things that are going on for the patient and address the most important um things for the patient at that consultation. And we can also give practical advice, you know, flare management and stuff like that as well. So a lot of talking, a lot of information sharing, and then maybe pointing on to physiotherapists and occupational therapists and, and other people that can um, help with, um, you know, the, the, the initial problems. Because as I say, it's a bit of a journey, isn't it? Every consultation, you're gonna have different needs. Um, Medication obviously forms quite a big part of those consultations as well, I would say, mm -hmm. um, the different medications, what they're used for and what to take when. And that, I think, probably, I'm right in saying, can be quite confusing for patients as well. Absolutely, a lot, yeah. A lot to take on. So then, as time goes on, medication support visits, you know, if patients have got a problem tolerating medications and they need to switch, for example, from methotrexate tablets to injections or something, they might see a nurse to do that if they're gonna add in sulfasalazine alongside methotrexate or they're gonna start leflunamide, that the nurse visit then comes again to do more medication education and support. So I should have said for the, for the first consultation in our clinics, those, those clinics are called early inflammatory arthritis clinics. So our patients um, are seen on a number of occasions. So 
what I've just mentioned probably doesn't always happen in one consultation. It might happen over a few. So um, I know lots of places do things slightly differently, but I think that initially there's probably quite a lot of contact with the nurse. And then the medication support visits, as I say, might be a little bit further down the line. Um, you're probably a little bit more experienced, but it's all about talking about medications, mainly side effects, how to manage them, blood monitoring and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then really important practical things like, you know, how to get further prescriptions and that kind of stuff. Because again, yeah. these are the things that we forget about as health professionals, but for a patient, it's really important. Where do I get more drugs from? Do I keep taking the drugs? Do I just stop them after the initial prescription and, and so on? And then obviously key to everything is how to get back in touch with the service if you've got problems tolerating the medications or if you've got any questions. So that's obviously always the advice line. And then the, the, the next, I guess, step of the journey is, is moving on to stronger therapies if you need to start biologic therapy. So a lot of what I do in my role um, is talking to patients about biologic treatments, um, screening them to start and then assessing their response to those treatments. So again, that's a lot of information giving. But the, the really nice thing or the thing I love most about my job is that um, patients that are on biologic therapies, I, I'm seeing them regularly and I get to know them really well and I know them for years. And that is by far the best part of my job because it, you know you're seeing people that you you know a lot about and and they know you really well so it's 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 a different kind of consultation to at the beginning when there's a lot of anxiety yes. obviously and also there's that real joy for you as a healthcare yeah. professional seeing them the difference these medications make and I should also um, have said right from the beginning, my name's Nadine Garland and I'm the Information and Support Manager <laughs> at NRANS. Um, so we work, you know, we like to support nurses when they're giving information with the information that NRANS has so that they can go away and read it and sit down and, and digest it. But one of the other things I think is important with that you do as nurses is you mentioned changing from oral medication to injections you do a bit of training about that don't you yeah so it's not as if people suddenly have to learn how to give themselves an injection and, and figure it out on their own no 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 we, so yeah the, the 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 decision would be made to switch to injections we you'd have a separate consultation for that we would um have the first injection there so the patient stops their oral therapy so they do their first injection on the day they see the nurse we watch them do it if they're confident, that's great. They go home and carry on. But if they're not, then they come back again and we'll support them right through because obviously injecting yourself is a bit of a weird one initially. Um, so you need that support. But once you're up and running, most people are, are absolutely fine. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, and a big part again as well, I think it's really important to, um, to say is about shared decision making so I've mentioned a lot of medication stuff and I think that's fine and dandy but not every patient that I see wants to start the medications I think they should start or the doctor thinks they should start so the whole point should be that your consultation is about sharing information and then making a decision between you and and the professional respecting the decision of the patient if actually their decision is to not to have that the treatment we've suggested or if they want to discuss other options so i think again it's really important that as a patient you shouldn't ever feel or oh, the doctors told me i've got to take it and if i don't take it I, I you know they won't want to see me again or or anything like that because it is is all about making sure it's right for the patient because you know, I suggest you take a treatment, but you can toddle out the door and think, well, I'm not taking that. I don't like the sound of it. Um, and then flush it down the toilet. I'm not suggesting yes. you do that, but, you know. No, no. But, <laughs> and then people so. do feel very much that they can't question the doctor because, you know, they're the doctor and they don't give them to them for fun. Um, but, yeah, so it's the they won't say anything at the time. And that's one of the things we were discussing early uh, earlier is the... Um, being able to have that rapport with your healthcare team like you were talking about is really important because the thing is it is never prescriptive you don't have this list of these is this is what I do for absolutely every patient what you're doing is seeing that person as an individual and looking at the barriers that will stop them from taking their medication and allowing them to have that relationship to ask those questions, I think is one of the, the most important and probably the most rewarding side of what you do. Completely, it's key, I think. I, um, 
when a patient first comes into the room, if I've not met them before, I always just take a bit of time to get to know them and get a feel from where they're coming from, because I think it's, it leads on really nicely, actually, to what I was just going to say. The next thing was just about the consultation itself. And this can be with the doctor or with the nurse, but obviously tonight we're, we're supposed to be focusing on the nurse consultations, but it's that idea of agenda setting, you know, that, that you go into the consultation, you've got your agenda. The health professional's got their agenda. Yes. They need to meet somewhere in the middle. And in that time frame that you've got, because it is always time pressured, you need to, between you, have both achieved most of the things you wanted to achieve. You probably aren't always gonna achieve everything. Um, so it's, it's really key for me, I think, and probably most nurses just say the same, to get a sense of the patient, where they're coming from. And, you know, if a patient's got an anxiety or a concern about something, they're not going to listen to anything else I say until I've addressed that concern. And if I can address it, then we can move on and then they're going to be more receptive to, to what I'm saying. So I think it's that that is really important. So, again, as a patient and it, I'll, I'll, um, I was going to go on to talk about we've done a little video um, called the ask approach to, to, to consultations and how to get the best out of them. So I'll talk through that a little bit. And that, again, links in. So the A in the ask approach is address. So as a patient, um, when you go into the consultation, it's that agenda setting thing. It's addressing your concerns right at the beginning, what, what, you, what you're worried about, what you want to talk about with the health professional. Um, put it out there. The more, the, share, the more that you share, the better, so that we can kind of come to an agreement. OK, well, we can talk about this. We probably won't have time to cover that, but these are the main things. So if you, if you address your concerns at the beginning, then you've given the, the person on the other side of the, the, the desk the, the time to kind of process it and think, right, okay, I need to get that covered in the consultation. So the, the S part of ask is share. So um, I love a list. So if you come in to see me with a list, I love it. And if you take notes, all the better. And if you bring somebody with you who also asks questions and take notes, then you're getting 10 out of 10 from me because I think that's great. Because I know you've, you've thought about the consultation. You're going to come in, you're going to share the, the symptoms you, that are bothering you most. Um, and then we can, we can help look at them together. The other side to that is you, you've probably noticed if you've been to a few consultations that the doctors and the nurses are going to ask you the same questions. They're going to ask you, have you had flares? Have you had morning stiffness? How long does it last? Are you having fatigue? If you've already got those answers in your head or written down on a bit of paper, that speeds up the consultation. So it then means that we've got time to then address what you want to talk about. Okay. So if you can do that, that's great. And what we actually do in our biologic clinics is we have a form called a focus form. The idea came from a brilliant OT that I met that was working in Wales and she used to use it and we sort of adapted it. So basically, we um, give people headers, sort of medication, fatigue, sex, you know, work, whatever, circle it if you want to talk about it. And then we ask people to grade um, fatigue and stiffness and so on, so that when they come into the consultation, I've, I've got that already, I can quickly scan it, I know where they're coming from. Um, and, and that helps form, you know, the, the sort of the framework for the consultation. So again, that sort of goes along with, with share. Um, and then K, the final bit of ask is no. So if you if you kind of know that the doctor suggested this medication, you're going to go and see the nurse to talk about it. If you've done a bit of research, if you've got your questions ready, that's really helpful because you've already started thinking about the medications. And so, for example, if you've read on the leaflet that, I don't know, you can't drink too much alcohol with this medication. And actually, you know, that you do like a drink and you drink more than 14 units a week and actually you don't really want to stop doing that, then that's really helpful for us because you can come in, be upfront and say, do you know what? Don't think I fancy this medication. <laughs> and I would much prefer honesty and openness because then you can make a plan between you and move on to other options. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, that it, it is that relationship, that two-way street. And we're getting a lot of comments. Uh, a lot of people are saying that what you're talking about is what they have and they really, really do appreciate their rheumatology nurse and the rest of the team and others are sitting there saying, oh, my goodness, I'm so jealous. This is what I would really, really like. And yeah, that's it. Move to Bristol and you get to meet Tracy and she can give you the service that you really want. And unfortunately, that's the way it is, you know, um, such a difference postcode lottery they call it but there is you know in most places some really good ones sometimes you need to find the one that works for you but also 
different people build a rapport with different people. I learned this growing up. My GP was part of a practice. The one I saw, my mum and I saw, she's one of these, she calls a spade a spade. No ifs, buts, maybes. And But her business partner was really gentle and which suited my my sister and my dad more because they don't and you know um don't like the direct approach yeah. and yeah. so you know it is it's depending on the approach the person our healthcare professionals are people too and so sometimes you just don't have a rapport but that's where the knowing yourself knowing what you need and being able to speak to them about it can make a difference it means that you can then approach that um the elephant in the room yeah and and also i think it's important to say you know as a health professional if somebody requested to see a nurse or a doctor and and you know it's we we understand everyone's human that not everyone loves everyone and gets on with everyone that you're going to have a better consultation with somebody than another so it's fine to say that nobody's going to take offense or or put a mark against mm. you if you sort of say do you know what i'd rather wait longer but i'd like to see that person because we know that that's that's it's whatever's right for the patient really and that's how it should be yeah. so yeah exactly. again no exactly. judgment kind of thing yeah um yeah and uh, just a, a one of the people has commented that the interaction between and dynamics between the consultant and the rheumatology nurse influence so much of the treatment too so i think that's really true as well it's when the rheumatologists respect and value the input that the nurses have because they basically it's not that you're saying anything different or doing anything different it's just that you might have a little bit more time to sit down and explain what's been said to them and as you said right at the beginning talk about the personal how that it, what that means for that individual in their life yeah and I think it's about timing as well I think you know the the, the rheumatology uh, the consultant Take the consultation with the rheumatologist can often sometimes feel, not intentionally but feel a bit hurried you know you might be offered mm. various sort of decisions to make and actually it's too big a decision to make on the spot you know so I think the time that you then have between that and seeing the nurse and that's where this sort of no bit comes in if you prepare if you do a bit of reading if you sort of really think about stuff when you come to see the nurse you you then that you can get the most out of it if you've done your homework and then you you then can share where you're coming from um, and then the questions you forgot to ask the doctor you can ask the nurse so it's yes. just about like you know getting the most out of the people that are there to help you really um, and like you say the role is is slightly different for the for the nurse and the doctor the, the only other thing I was just going to say quickly that I've got on my little flashcard here to say before <laughs> forget, which I think it can be important for people when they're newly diagnosed is that the, the medications we use are a bit annoying because they are slow acting. They take a while to kick in, but you can get side effects straight away. And it's really key that people know that they should let us know if they have a problem. Um, yes. And and then, you know, because like we've mentioned already about methotrexate injections, there can often be a plan B. There can often be another format, another thing to do. You can increase your sulfasalazine tablets a bit slower if you're getting nausea with them. So, and again, that's where the nurse can help support you. Um, don't think it's take this medication, go away. We don't want to see you in three months. You know, we, we can help. And if it doesn't suit you, we can try something else. So it's mm. really important that, that people, you know, keep, keep in touch with, with their team if they're yes. having problems. Um, because it, yeah, it, at the beginning to manage the disease, time is important. We need to get in there quickly, get you on the right medication and get the inflammation controlled. And um, that is with drugs that take a while to work, which is annoying, but they do work well, so yes. stick with it. <laughs> yes. Um, but then again, you know, not every medication works in the same way for every person. And that's why it is a little bit of trial and error and, you know, why you, you will change it. And it's not that, you know, the healthcare professionals don't know what they're doing it's just that everyone's disease is different and reacts and responds to different medications in different ways 100 percent. yeah that's a really really important point yeah and I, I like the I mean I'm not always a huge fan of acronyms but ask actually makes sense it's not one that you have to think oh what was that again and it is all about giving you knowledge and I've always believed that we talk about knowledge as power, but I think it goes a step back.
back and it's the access to knowledge is power. So knowing where you can go, where you can get trusted information from means that you don't have to know it all, but you know who you can ask that yeah. might. <laughs> No, exactly. And I, and I meant to say to you early, actually, and I'm not just saying this because we're doing a, a <laughs> but I absolutely love all of your information. And I, I feel really proud when I give it to patients because I think it's so accessible and so informative. Um, mm. And it's invaluable as a health professional to have that to give to patients. Um, so I think you should be Absolutely. congratulated on that because it's great um, and particularly the one probably that I use most is around work around yep. sort of employee the employee and then for PIP and stuff like that because I think often when patients are at their lowest ebb that's brilliant because I can't go through it all with them in the consultation but I can give them that and no. I know it's going to be really supportive yeah and one of the things that I love most about publications is precisely that you get delivered an awful lot of information at the appointments mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how good the healthcare professional is at delivering it they're talking about a disease a disease process but what the person receiving the information is hearing how is that going to impact my life it means I can't go out and you know drink on the weekends with the boys because it interferes so you know you you just don't hear exactly what's being told to you so that's why I really like having our publications so that you can read a little bit put it down walk away digest it see how that fits in with your life and then come back to it yeah. because you know you don't remember everything um, and yeah so I think having everything that you can do to support that information and that's why we always have healthcare professionals involved in the writing of our publications is so that we make sure that we are on song that we're giving the same message that it's not something that we've just decided might be a good idea so yeah no, thank you for that but no no that's really evident and then my final point sorry i will stop talking no that's it. okay it's just sort of like top tips really to again to just help you get the most out of it and i know a lot of patients get frustrated when we see them in clinic because they may have had a flare two weeks before and had loads of swollen joints and then they come to see us and their joints don't look too bad and we're trying to make decisions about switching treatment and so mm. always remember take a picture with your phone um and and some centers you can email them in as well if you're having a flare in between visits or, or bring, bring your phone, show the pictures to whoever you're seeing so that we can get a feel for what the swelling's like and, and how bad it is. Not that we don't believe you, but it's just really helping <laughs> you get a sense of how bad things are to then work out what medication needs tweaking and to what degree. Yes, um, uh, exactly. Um, but, um, and the other thing, oh, apps, yeah. So we're just looking at getting an app in our service and I know okay. that centers have already so they're really helpful to track your progress in between visits and that can help in the consultation as well because again recall is really difficult when you come into a consultation and I say to a patient right how long are you stiff for in the mornings and they're like whatever or in the last week or you know and then we go through the routine of well I get up in the morning and I do this and I do that and so sometimes it's just really good if you've had an app and you've sort of over the last couple of weeks prior to coming to your consultation you've put in how long your early morning stiffness is, you can kind of get a sense of it. And then, then you can look at the app with your health professional and then, you know, figure out what your average is. And again, that just helps you know that you're giving them the right information, that it's an accurate yes. reception of how your disease has been. Um, and for the health professional, it's really useful to just be really clear. Um, yeah. And then the final thing is, you obviously already know this, but blood tests just prior to any consultation is super helpful because, again, if we're making any decisions about change in treatment, if you've had recent blood tests, we can it just speeds it up a little bit. So that's great if you can do that. I'm constantly being roused on by my uh, rheumatology nurse for forgetting to have yeah, blood yeah, tests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love a blood test. <laughs> yes, so I know it is, it is really important to do that. Thank you, Tracy. That's really helpful to everyone at every level. And I, I think that what you're saying is very true. It is that rapport, that relationship that you get as much out of as the, the patients do. So that's really nice to know as well. Definitely. So I have a few more questions for you. Um, so what does a typical day look like for a rheumatology nurse specialist? Okay, um, I guess most days um, there's usually a clinic, so either telephone or face-to-face, -face, um, seeing patients 
again, my role is primarily seeing patients on biologics, so either screening them to start treatment or um, reviewing their response to treatment. So examining patients, looking at blood tests, um, making a plan, changing their treatment. I'm a nurse prescriber, so I can change treatments if, if I feel that's appropriate. So that, yeah, that can speed up things a little bit in consultations. So um, nurse clinics and then um, advice line is uh, a massive part of our role so we do sort of share that out between us in the team but supporting patients on the advice line as well so sort of signposting maybe bringing them in for appointments maybe tweaking medication a little bit but don't do that too much over the phone unless we've seen them recently mm -hmm. um, but trying to support patients lots of emails I never thought I'd spend as much of my life sat in front of a computer as a nurse as I do now mm -hmm. but definitely lots of emails um and then i guess is that know, just um since covid or was that started before um yeah it's probably increased i would have said since covid we don't tend to email directly patients that much it's mainly emailing within the team emailing other specialties about patients and things like that with the biologic therapies a lot of um the home care prescription work is done via email so that take there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make sure patients get their medications delivered that their bloods are checked and that everything's safe so there's quite a lot of admin involved and most nurses will probably say to you they don't have as much admin support as they'd like so they do end up spending time doing tasks that actually probably could be done by somebody who isn't a, a qualified nurse mm -hmm. um so that's um yeah sometimes a bit frustrating but yeah that's that's life um and then obviously you know there's meetings so we have meetings to um discuss patients if they mm -hmm. um you know sort of complex patients or we have a, a meeting to discuss biologic patients and so on so um meeting with your colleagues to try and um figure out the best plan uh, for patients and then uh, yeah quite a bit of time as well is spent on sort of service development so there's always a new challenge. Um, changes in blood monitoring in the community has been the most recent one that I've been working on. So things like that. So just adapting and COVID has brought with it many challenges and adapting yes. um, for us. So it just feels like we've sort of gone, not so much been able to look at improving our services, just reacting to the, the, the challenges that COVID has thrown up. So I'm looking forward to that settling a bit so that we can then get back to focusing on moving the service forward and improving it for, for patients really. Brilliant. Now, uh, two things that you mentioned there. You mentioned that you're a nurse prescriber. Can you explain what that is? Yes, sorry. So that means that I did um, a, a training course to be able to prescribe drugs. So I could prescribe, in theory, any drug that I wanted to for a patient, but I would only ever prescribe uh, rheumatology drugs for a patient that I've assessed myself. Um, so that I've discussed all the risks, potential side effects of medication and made sure it's safe for the patient to have it. So I can prescribe um, disease modifying drugs, um, which would be like methotrexate, flunamide, um, salazine. I can prescribe biologic therapies as well. So if I see a patient in my clinic and they're not responding to the treatment, I can change it and then just prescribe it for them. Um, and I can obviously prescribe steroids and things like that as well if they're needed, if people are having flares. So it just means that I don't have to go to a doctor to get them to sign a prescription. And it makes perfect sense because if I've seen you and assessed you in clinic, I should be the person yeah. making that decision and prescribing for you, not somebody sat in the room next door that's not actually Absolutely. a surgeon. So, yeah. That's great. And also people have been asking, uh, which is the app that you you personally use most? We haven't started using it yet, but it's called, oh gosh, Living Living Well or Living With app. Okay. We're literally talking about it at the moment with the with the company. Yeah. Sorry, I should know that, shouldn't I? I no, that's okay. Exactly I think um, it's called Living Well or Living With. I think it might be called Living Well. And it's, okay. it's just for rheumatoid arthritis, I think, at the moment. Um, the, the, the hospital in North Bristol is using it and it, it's going really well there. Right. And that's the, the general point is ask your, your team which app they use because Rumor Buddy is great, but only if your hospital is actually on that app and uses that app. So it's no point getting one that, you know, you can't uh, access all of your results on and things like that. Yeah, and it's and it's all about the boring stuff is getting the IT team on side is making sure that mm -hmm. it's paid for and funded that it's going to be maintained because you know personally I don't want to encourage people to start using something that isn't maintained. Um, yes. We did have that with a different app for a different disease process and that was quite disappointing really so I think it's yeah you want to know that it's for the long term 
that it works for patients and that the IT guys can work with it really. So yeah, that's that's what's going on at the moment in our department, yeah. Okay, so another really good question, curly one. If money was no object, what would your dream rheumatology service look like? Well, it would be based somewhere hot on a beach. and <laughs> Come back to Australia with me. <laughs> No, um, there'd be a cake in the waiting room for everyone while they were, no, no, it wouldn't be cake, it would be fruit, wouldn't it? Because we're all trying to be healthy. Yes. Um, I think, yeah, so I think, uh, obviously more nurses, I'm going to say that, aren't I? Because I'm biased. Um, I think um, a big thing that I, in our service, we need and we don't have is a clinical psychologist. And it would make a massive difference to our patients if we could have somebody working in our department specifically working with people with long-term conditions because I think a lot of um, patients would would benefit massively from that and actually it would reduce in a way some of the medications that we have to use and it would improve quality of life so a clinical psychologist in the team for me would be amazing and um, we're trying to get one but we've been Absolutely. a long time. Um, yeah. more, more nurse specialists I think because probably every nurse specialist that you talk to works more hours than they're paid to work and their home life suffers. So if there were more of us, we would be less frazzled um, and be able to look a bit brighter eyed and maybe give a better service because we're not so tired. Um, yeah. So I think that would um, be really important. Um, what else could I say? Uh, I can't think of anything else, but there must be- I think a real multidisciplinary approach. So having physiotherapists and occupational therapists that are you know all know what's going on with your thing rather than being sent out to a different department or having to wait you know being able to see them a, an actual rheumatology physio who's not going to give you stupid exercises that he would somebody else your own age um, that's got a, a bit of a dodgy knee so I think yeah we're very lucky you see we have specific physiotherapists and occupational therapists for our patients and they're based in our department so wow. we're super lucky yeah I think probably the other area that's ignored is feet actually so having um, a podiatrist in the department um, yes. having regular foot clinics um, that that would be another part of the the dream service wouldn't it yeah because yes. feet get super ignored and um, I refer to the orthotist a lot for insoles and things like that but I think there's a lot more that can be done in that respect um, yeah, absolutely yeah. Mm. Um, and afterwards, but I can't you'd be very <laughs> jealous that I brought with me my orthotics that I had made before I left Australia in end of 2019 and they're actually made on a 3D printer oh, wow. so wow. they're wafer thin and fit any shoes and being at home I wasn't wearing my shoes as much so my feet have sort of spread out and it had a little ridge around the edge so I took them to the um uh, have them altered and the podiatrist looked at these and looked and he said there's absolutely no way I could make anything better than this oh, shall I just good. shave a bit off the edge here I went, yeah that might be an idea yeah. but yeah they are it makes a huge difference I would not be without where I am without orthotics so very much the case yeah yeah okay so what if somebody had to move health authorities would they just immediately get access to the medications or what happens? What's the process when somebody moves? Yeah, so I guess that's thinking more about the high cost drugs, the biologic type end of things. So yeah, yes. if you um, live in, I mean, it should be in the United Kingdom. It shouldn't make any difference if you move to Scotland or Wales um, or even Ireland. If you meet the nice, or if you have met the nice criteria to start a biologic drug, then that prescription should be continued. Um, what we do is we, uh, when a patient's moving somewhere else, there's a grace period where we keep prescribing for them. So we can arrange for the medication to be delivered to them at home in their new address, wherever it is. We encourage them as soon as they have moved to register with a GP. And then they need to ask their GP to refer them to a local rheumatology department. And then they need to wait until they have their first consultation in the new rheumatology department and see the nurse and they will then get the medication prescribed for them there. And then we always ask them to let us know when that's happened so that we can then close their account from our end. 
Um, so it should be seamless. We would never leave a patient without drug. Um, so the patient mm -hmm. should have plenty of drug to tide them over to, to then be set up in their new, um, in their new place. But it, it is that thing of getting the GP to refer you. A lot of people think that rheumatology teams refer one to the other and we mm -hmm. don't do that. And um, so it is a little bit clunky and I know that getting registered with a GP can be a bit time consuming, but it's all doable and you should never be refused the medication. If you've been assessed to have it, then you have it and you continue on it. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so previously hand and feet x-rays were done to monitor the progression of the mm. disease. Then it turned to um, being using ultrasounds. Why the change and how often do they need to be done? Oh, that's a really good question. So hands and feet x-rays um, were done in the good old days because you were looking for what we call erosive damage to bones. So when you've got inflammation in a joint and the inflammation has damaged the cartilage lining of the joint and then got down to bone and damaged the bone, that's when you have what we call erosive disease. And those changes in bone show up on x-ray, but x-ray shows bone, it doesn't really show you the soft tissues. You can't necessarily directly see the cartilage, but you can see the space in the joints. So you can guess if the cartilage has been damaged as well. So x-rays used to be used of hands and feet. Um, they were always taken at diagnosis and they used to be repeated every two years because changes on x-rays are quite delayed. So they don't always show up straight mm -hmm. away. So it was a way of monitoring disease, but actually you've kind of, you're shutting the gate after the horse has bolted, if you like, because by the time you've seen an erosion on an x-ray, you, you've Absolutely. missed the boat. <clears throat> so when I first started working in rheumatology, people would arrive and their, their notes would come and then they'd have massive you know, containers full of their x-ray films and they'd have had loads and loads of x-rays done, but it didn't necessarily mean that their treatment was as good as it could have been. So mm. ultrasound scanning is um, a, a different way of looking at joints. It's more looking at the soft tissue. So you can look at tendons, you can actually see fluid. So if there's inflammation there, if there's swelling there, you can see if it's active. Um, if there's a, we talk about a Doppler signal, and if you see the scan on the machine, you can see if it's red, that's showing warmth, that's showing extra blood supply, um, and it can show if there's a focus of inflammation there. It lets the person scanning know that you've got active rheumatoid arthritis in your joints and that that needs to be treated straight away. You, you could look at bone with ultrasound scan and you could make, you could probably see erosions, but again, you, ideally you want a patient that is having ultrasound scans that you're not getting to the point of erosions. Now, there's no sort of set, you know, you should have an ultrasound scan every six months or every year. I think if you're seen in clinic and examined and the person examining you feels that your disease is well controlled, then they won't need to scan you. But if mm -hmm. you're not sure, um, you know, sometimes there can be what we call subclinical stuff going on. So you can't necessarily see it or feel it in the joints, but you just got that feeling, you're not quite sure. You could then refer somebody for an ultrasound scan it can be really reassuring. I love it. I think it's brilliant okay. because it can reassure the patient. It reassures you as a clinician that the disease is under control. Now, there is still, I would say, time and a place for x-rays, um, particularly in patients that have had lots of previous joint damage that have got what we call mm -hmm. chronic changes because it can show if there are changes that are occurring um, and whether you maybe need to be thinking about referring to an orthopedic surgeon or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's still a place for x-rays, um, but, but ultrasound scanning is better because it means that you're paying closer attention to the disease and you're able to treat it more promptly, I would say, than, than just going on x-rays. That's good. Cool. And one of the things that you, you mentioned there was um, sort of to reassure, but some people find that their bloods, blood results are showing that they you know, aren't in, having inflammation, but they're still feeling there's swelling or stiffness and things in the joints. So can ultrasound show what's going on there as well? Yeah, absolutely. So for some patients, they'll never have a rise in their inflammation markers. And that's it's about knowing what's normal for that patient. Mm. Uh, and uh, the CRP is the one that we look at mainly, and that does tend to track inflammation. So if you've got inflammation, usually a CRP is fairly going to be in line with that. But just bear in mind that other things can affect your CRP. Um, so if you've got an infection that can put your CRP up, um, sometimes if you're, if you're very overweight, you can always have quite a high CRP or a slightly raised CRP. So again, that's mm -hmm. normal for you. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you, 
So if you if your bloods are normal, but you've got pain and and you're having, you know, as we said, pain waking you in the night, if you're having lots of stiffness in the mornings, if you've got lots of fatigue, you want to have a scan because the scan can then reassure you. The pain can be caused by a number of things that can be caused by osteoarthritis or if you've had previous <laughs> um, damage to the joints. And sometimes other things like fibromyalgia where you're getting muscle pain, you know, you might not be able to differentiate that, mm -hmm. but a scan can tell you if there's inflammation within a joint. Um, and if you have a scan and it, and it reassures you that there isn't, then that's great. Because I think as a patient, it should give you the comfort that there's no damage being done because pain doesn't always mean damage. And I think sometimes yes. that's the, the thing that it's just remembering that as well. Yeah. And that segues into a question that I'll jump ahead to, which is about blood tests. So what blood tests are taken for both diagnosis of RA, as well as knowing, you know, if you're in flare or if the treatments are working. Yeah. So, so diagnosis of RA, it's really important, I would say, just at the beginning, to not get too hooked on blood tests and what they mean. Um, rheumatoid factor can be positive or negative. So you can have a rheumatoid factor positive rheumatoid arthritis. You can have a rheumatoid factor negative rheumatoid arthritis. For us as clinicians, it's useful to know because usually zero positive i.e. rheumatoid factor positive, can mean you're more likely to have maybe more severe disease, um, possibly more likely to have more erosive disease, but you can still have that kind of joint damage with a seronegative disease as well. Sorry, seronegative as in rheumatoid factor negative. The rheumatoid factor can also change as well. Um, so if you are rheumatoid factor positive, you can have certain medications, for example, rituximab, that can change your, your um, positivity to negativity and over okay. time your positivity can change. So when we do your, your blood test at the beginning, if you have a rheumatoid factor and if it's really, really high, that could be interpreted as, as a, an indication that your disease is going to be fairly aggressive and that we need to use um, quite a lot of medication to get it under control. The other one that we look at is, is anti-CCP antibody. Now, again, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be that useful to go into it in too much detail because it can be positive or negative. Um, positive means you've definitely got or you're going to have at some point rheumatoid arthritis because you can have a positive anti-CCP antibody and not have rheumatoid arthritis at that point. If it's negative, again, it doesn't mean you've not got it or you're never going to have it. So it's something that we do as clinicians, but I think from a patient perspective, it's probably less useful to, to get your head around that one. We would always do a set of bloods looking at your red and white blood cells. So if you've got lots of inflammation going on and really active rheumatoid, you'll often find that people are a bit anemic. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're, they're platelets, so they're little blood cells that help with clotting, they can be raised. Um, Sometimes as well, your white cell count can be raised if you've got lots of inflammation going on. Um, we also always look at liver and kidneys. And again, sometimes um, you, you can get, there's another one in your liver blood test that, that can be a bit raised if you've got lots of inflammation going on. So it's looking at that broad picture. The one, as I said, that probably tracks inflammation most closely is C-reactive protein or CRP that's uh, released by your liver when you've got inflammation going on. Um, so normally, depending on the lab result, that should be less than six. And if it's above that, then it's inflamed and obviously it can go significantly up. Now, if it was up over 100, then you're probably thinking of infection. Um, but, you know, 20 or 30, you're probably thinking active rheumatoid arthritis. So if you're looking at blood results, that would be the one to look at because that's probably okay. going to be the most information. As long as you're somebody where you get a raised CRP, if you don't, then don't look at it at all. It's not going to help you. It's a waste of time. <laughs> that's it. And I mean, um, it can, like you say, it can change. So I originally, my ESR was my, um, you know, real sensitive, um, you know, uh, reflection of, flares yeah. and for many many years because I had it long before the new medications were available it hung up between 90 and 120 wow um, for about six years so uh, yeah um, but then a different treatment and it it's been normal and it's been my CRP that is used to, to measure my flares and, and what's actually going on. So you, you, it's a really sneaky disease because once you think you've got your head around what it's doing and how to read it, then it goes and changes. So it's horrible to, to have that sort of um, not knowing. But yeah, always
always speak to your um, rheumatology nurse or your team about your results. Yeah. Not everybody wants to know their results, and that's also good. You know, that's fine too. But yeah. uh, just to you were saying, you know, it's really complex. One of the things that has been available for a long time were the methotrexate, um, the blood monitoring cards. They're no longer in print. So we have at, at NRAS decided to do a book on blood matters. Brilliant. And uh, so we're in the process of, I think we're in the final stages of getting that uh, ready and out. So it talks about the different blood results and, and as you said, even touches on anemia and other things as well that can impact your uh, how you're feeling. So um, I think, you know, it's a really good one. Keep your eye out for that. Really, again, very proud of the work that's being done and lots of pe professionals have sort of had input in that. So it's a, a positive thing as well. So we could talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we're running out of time. Okay. Um, so we did receive some questions about the antiviral treatments for COVID-19 for people that are vulnerable or were on the clinically extremely vulnerable list. So my team and I work um, every week. We go through all of the most recent uh, outputs from the government of what they're saying and so we have an article on the treatments that I just updated this week um, and so if you go onto our website and look at our COVID-19 section in the news part there is lots of information about that but just to generally say not everybody that got letters to say that they were clinically extremely vulnerable are actually in the category for being eligible for the um, antivirals or monoclonal antibodies. So speak with your team because a lot of it is about clinical decision making, other diseases that you might have, you know, how long you've been on steroids, lots of things that impact on your eligibility for this. Initially, you needed to have a, um, a PCR test to be eligible to um, go on them, but now you just need to do a lateral flow test, but you do need to have an indication that you are eligible before you get there because it's too late to spend, you know, three days trying to track down your rheumatologist to say that you are eligible for it. But all that information's on there and it is changing regularly. So that's why I don't like to say one thing now and then it gets changed in two days time. So please keep an eye on the website. We're also working with a consortium of patient organisations uh, to make sure that the voices of the clinically extremely vulnerable and immunosuppressed are being heard in the changes that are currently happening with you know, lockdown no longer being required, PCR tests. So again, it's a very much watch this space because... Uh, part of this uh, consortium met with um, ministers today and put a lot of questions to them about what's happening and, and who's eligible. And on the whole, most of the reply was, we don't know yet. So we are pushing to make sure that that voice is being heard. So as soon as we know something, we will share it with you. But thank you very much, Tracy. It's been an absolute amazing evening. And um, is there anything else that you wanted to add that you haven't mentioned before? No, I don't think so. I've really enjoyed it. It's been great. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope it's been helpful. Well, from the messages that um, I can't keep up with, <laughs> my, if you wonder why I keep, I've got my phone down there with the messages flicking up, <laughs> it's all moving too quickly. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you very much for that. And thank you, everybody else. Have a wonderful evening. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye.